The whole land of Numenor was so poised as if it had been thrust upward out of the sea, but tilted southward and a little eastward, and save upon the south, the land in nearly all places fell towards the sea in steep cliffs. In Numenor, birds that dwell near the sea, and swim or dive in it, abode in multitudes beyond reckoning. The mariners said that, were they blind, they still would know that their ship was drawing near to Numenor, because of the great clamour of the birds of the shore. And when any ship approached the land, seabirds in great flocks would arise and fly above it in welcome and gladness, for they were never killed or molested by intent. Some would accompany ships on their voyages, even those that went to Middle-earth. Hello Tolkien Geeks! This video is part of my playlist series on the island state of Numenor, the great superpower of Middle-earth's Second Age. Make sure to like the video and please do subscribe to Voice of Geekdom if you've not already done so. Numenor, the land of Elena, was a large island in the shape of a five-pointed star. Tolkien never drew a map which gave its exact location relative to the Westlands of Middle-earth. We only know for sure that, according to the Akalavath section in the Silmarillion, it was said to be closer to Valinor, the land of the Valar, than to Endor, that's Middle-earth and that the Numenorians with the sharpest eyesight were able to see Tol Eresea, the island near the coast of Valinor, from a sufficiently high vantage point on the island. On various world maps, Numenor has been drawn as far north as being level with the delta of the river Anduin, which is in the Bay of Belfalas or as far south as the so-called Girdle of Arda, i.e. the Equator, and most often somewhere in between. Karen Wynne Fonstad estimated its location a little lower than the harbour of Umbar. That's the city from which the Corsairs of Umbar that we meet in The Lord of the Rings originated from. Umbar was originally a Numenorean colony, which we will be covering later in this series. In the centre of the land of Numenor is the great mountain called the Meneltarma, the Pillar of the Heavens, a holy place which is dedicated to the veneration and worship of Eru Eluvatar, the creator god of Tolkien's secondary world. Those who ascended to the summit of the mountain were required to observe absolute silence. The eagles of Manwë, the elder king of the Valar, also guarded the mountain until the shadow fell on Numenor in later years. The summit of the Menel Tarma is famously the only place where explicit religious worship is recorded in Tolkien's works. Ceremonial feasts in honour of Eru were traditionally held at the mountain summit thrice annually. Although the direct ascent to the summit was steep, the mountain's base sloped outward gently into five roots which pointed outward in the directions of the five points of the land itself. At the base of the Menel Tarma, on the southeastern side, on a foothill of the mountain, is Numenor's capital of Armenelos the Golden, City of Kings. Armenelos was the greatest city in the history of men, greater even than the city of Osgiliath in Gondor. It was the site of the House of the Kings, and of the King's Court where the White Tree grew, Nimloth, which was brought to Numenor from Tol Eresea, a gift of the visiting Eldar. Numenor's White Tree the ancestor of the White Tree of Gondor 
was a seedling of Celeborn in Eresea, which was itself a seedling of Galathilion, which was made by the Valar Yavanna herself, in the image of Telperion, the elder of the two trees of Valinor, from the time before the attack of Melkor and Ungoliant, which is recorded in the Silmarillion. Armenelos was situated in the region called Arandor, the King's Land, the most important region of Numenor, which also contains the legendary port of Romena. The Numenorians, as you'd imagine for a race of mariners, built great shipyards in Romena in the years of their prosperity, and most of the eastward traffic towards Middle-earth went through the harbour there. Off the coast of the Bay of Romena lies Tol Uinen. Legend has it that Tol Uinen was placed there by Uinen the Maya, a spirit of the sea who served the Valar Olmo. She was held in reverence by the mariners of Numenor, who would often petition her for calmer seas during particularly long voyages. From Romena, the main road through the centre of the island, the only fully paved road which was suitable for wagons and carts, extends back through Armenelos and past the Menel Tarma, where it splits off and winds around the mountain as it climbs towards the summit. The main branch of the road heads northwest up towards Ondosto, a city in the south of the northernmost point of the star, the region known as Forostar. Forostar is a rugged and mountainous region which Christopher Tolkien speculated may have contained stone quarries in the south around Ondosto. Further up, near to the North Cape, was the island's other named mountain, Sorontil, which was the location of the Eries of the Eagles of Manwë. At the top of that mountain, Tar Menildur, one of the early kings of Númenor, whom we shall be covering in the very next video in this series, built a tower with which to gaze at the stars and study their movements. The road continues westward into the region known as Andustar, which was notable for the city of Andunie, which was ruled by the lords of Andunie, the line of the faithful, those who remained true to the Valar throughout the years of darkness to come. We'll learn much more about them in future videos as well. To the south of the Andustar was the Bay of Eldana, which the unfinished tales tells us was the location of the most beautiful of all the havens of Numenor, Eldalonde, the haven of the elves. This was where the elves of Tol Eresea landed when they visited the island. When they arrived, they would bring gifts from Valinor, most notable of which were the fragrant trees, including the Malinorne, the silver-golden Malorn trees which we see later in Lothlorien in The Lord of the Rings. But the woods around Eldalonde are filled with many other varieties of trees from Numenor besides the Malorns, and sweet-smelling shrubs and grasses. The river Nunduine flowed through the lands here from its source close to the Menel Tarma. South of El Dalonde was the region of Hyarnustar, barren and mountainous in the south and west, but lush and fertile in the land around the Cyril River. Here there were vineyards thriving in the tropical climate. Further down the river and around the delta, there were many fishing villages, the largest being Nindamos, on the eastern shore of the river delta. The south coast was the only coast on the island that descended gently down towards sea level, 
Most of the rest of the island was surrounded by sheer cliffs, and this is the only place that the fishing trade thrived. A fishing trade that was vital to sustain the population of the island. On the eastern side of the Cyril was the Hiaro Star, which was covered in dense forest land. This was the region from which the men of Numenor felled the trees which became lumber for the shipyards of Romenna to expand the ever-growing armada. The final promontory was the Orostar, a cooler climb which was suitable for agriculture and the growing of grain, especially closer to the Mittelmar, the central lands. Each of these six regions we've been discussing sent councillors to Armenelos to form the Council of the Scepter, which was headed up by the heir to the throne. In the early days, this council served in an advisory capacity only, but in later years, as the shadow fell on Numenor, they took on a more active role which, despite his famous aversion to allegorical storytelling, is probably reflective of Tolkien's own view on politics, in my opinion. In one of the published letters, he described himself as a supporter of unconstitutional monarchy, as well as an anarchist, and the concentration of power into a bureaucratic governing body like the Council of the Scepter in Numenor is mirrored in what we see happen in Gondorian politics, for example. This change in the role of the council is described as a gradual one. In general, we see a slow, regressive slide in Numenorean society towards the deeply morally compromised state that it finds itself in, in latter years. We'll see that decline play out gradually over the course of this series, as we continue to investigate the history of Numenor, and its expanding influence over Middle-earth during the Second Age. In the next video, we'll cover the sundering of the line of Elros, as the scepter passes from Tar Elendil, the great-grandson of Elros, to Tar Meneldur, his son passing over the older sister, Silmarien, whose son Volondil founded the line of the Lords of Andunie.